Section 4 of Stories by Foreign Authors, Russian Authors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Grenholm. Stories of Foreign Authors, Russian Authors by Various. St. John's Eve by Nikolai Vasilievich Gogol. Translated by Isabel F. Hapgood, 1886. Related by the Sacristan of the Dakanka Church. Toma Grigorovich had a very strange sort of eccentricity. To the day of his death, he never liked to tell the same thing twice. There were times when, if you asked him to relate a thing afresh, behold, he would interpolate new matter, or alter it so that it was impossible to recognize it. Once on a time, one of those gentlemen, it is hard for us simple people to put a name to them, to say whether they are scribblers or not scribblers, but it is just the same thing as the usurers at our yearly fairs. They clutch and beg and steal every sort of frippery, and issue mean little volumes, no thicker than an ABC book, every month or even every week one of these gentlemen wormed this same story out of toma grigorovitch and he completely forgot about it but that same young gentleman in the pea-green caftan whom i have mentioned and one of whose tales you have already read i think came from poltava bringing with him a little book and opening it in the middle shows it to us Toma Grigorovitch was on the point of setting his spectacles astride of his nose, but recollected that he had forgotten to wind thread about them and stick them together with wax, so he passed it over to me. As I understand something about reading and writing, and do not wear spectacles, I undertook to read it. I had not turned two leaves when all at once he caught me by the hand and stopped me. Stop! Tell me first what you are reading! i confess that i was a little stunned by such a question what what am i reading toma grigorovitch these were your very words who told you that they were my words why what more would you have here it is printed related by such and such a sacristan speak on the head of the man who printed that he lies the dog of a moscow peddler did i say that that was just the same as though one hadn't his wits about him listen i'll tell it to you on the spot we moved up to the table and he began my grandfather the kingdom of heaven be his may he eat only wheaten rolls and makovniki with honey in the other world could tell a story wonderfully well when he used to begin on a tale you wouldn't stir from the spot all day but keep on listening he was no match for the storyteller of the present day when he begins to lie with a tongue as though he had had nothing to eat for three days so that you could snatch your cap and flee from the house as i now recall it my old mother was alive then in the long winter evenings when the frost was crackling out of doors and had so sealed up hermetically the narrow panes of our cottage she used to sit before the hackling comb drawing out a long thread in her hand rocking the cradle with her foot and humming a song which i seem to hear even now the fat lamp quivering and flaring up as though in fear of something lighted us within our cottage the spindle hummed and all of us children collected in a cluster listened to grandfather who had not crawled off the oven for more than five years owing to his great age but the wondrous tales of the incursions of the zaporozian cossacks the poles the bold deeds of podkava of polter kozak and sagadachny did not interest us so much as the stories about some deed of old which always sent a shiver through our frames and made our hair rise upright on our heads sometimes such terror took possession of us in consequence of them that from that evening on heaven knows what a marvel everything seemed to us if you chance to go out of the cottage after nightfall for anything you imagine that a visitor from the other world has lain down to sleep in your bed and i should not be able to tell this a second time were it not that i had often taken my own smock at a distance as it lay at the head of the bed for the evil one rolled up in a ball 
but the chief thing about grandfather's stories was that he never had lied in all his life and whatever he said was so was so i will now relate to you one of his marvellous tales i know that there are a great many wise people who copy in the courts and can even read out civil documents who if you were to put into their hand a simple prayer book could not make out the first letter in it and would show all their teeth in derision which is wisdom these people laugh at everything you tell them such incredulity has spread abroad in the world what then why may god and the holy virgin cease to love me if it is not possible that even you will not believe me once he said something about witches what then along comes one of these headbreakers and doesn't believe in witches yes glory to god that i have lived so long in the world i have seen heretics to whom it would be easier to lie in confession than it would be to our brothers and equals to take snuff and those people would deny the existence of witches but let them just dream about something and they won't even tell what it was there's no use in talking about them st john's eve no one could have recognized this village of ours a little over a hundred years ago a hamlet it was the poorest kind of a hamlet half a score of miserable isbas unplastered badly thatched were scattered here and there about the fields there was not an enclosure or decent shed to shelter animals or wagons that was the way the wealthy lived and if you had looked for our brothers the poor why a hole in the ground that was a cabin for you only by the smoke could you tell that a god created man lived there you ask why they lived so it was not entirely through poverty almost every one led a wandering cossack life and gathered not a little plunder in foreign lands it was rather because there was no reason for setting up a well-ordered kata or a wooden house how many people were wandering all over the country crimeans poles lithuanians it was quite possible that their own countrymen might make a descent and plunder everything anything was possible in this hamlet a man or rather a devil in human form often made his appearance why he came and whence no one knew he prowled about got drunk and suddenly disappeared as if into the air and there was not a hint of his existence then again behold he seemed to have dropped from the sky and went flying about the streets of the village of which no trace now remains and which was not more than a hundred paces from the Kanka. he would collect together all the cossacks he met then there were songs laughter money in abundance and vodka flowed like water he would address the pretty girls and give them ribbons earrings strings of beads more than they knew what to do with it is true that the pretty girls rather hesitated about accepting his presence god knows perhaps they had passed through unclean hands my grandfather's aunt who kept a tavern at that time in which basavryak as they called that devil man often had his carouses said that no consideration on the face of the earth would have induced her to accept a gift from him and then again how avoid accepting fear seized on every one when he knit his bristly brows and gave a sidelong glance which might send your feet god knows whither but if you accept then the next night some fiend from the swamp with horns on his head comes to call and begins to squeeze your neck when there is a string of beads upon it or bite your finger if there is a ring upon it or drag you by the hair if ribbons are braided in it god have mercy then on those who owned such gifts but here was the difficulty it was impossible to get rid of them if you threw them into the water the diabolical ring or necklace would skim along the surface and into your hand there was a church in the village st pontella if i remember rightly there lived there a priest father athanasi of blessed memory observing that basavryak did not come to church even on easter he determined to reprove him and impose penance upon him well he hardly escaped with his life hark ye panochi he thundered in reply 
learn to mind your own business instead of meddling in other people's if you don't want that goat's throat of yours stuck together with boiling kutya what was to be done with this unrepentant man father athanasi contented himself with announcing that any one who should make the acquaintance of basavryuk would be counted a catholic an enemy of christ's church not a member of the human race in this village there was a cossack named Korts who had a laborer whom people called peter the orphan perhaps because no one remembered either his father or mother the church starut elder it is true said that they had died of the pest in his second year but my grandfather's aunt would not hear to that and tried with all her might to furnish him with parents although poor peter needed them about as much as we need last year's snow she said that his father had been in Zaporozhye, taken prisoner by the Turks, underwent God only knows what tortures, and, having, by some miracle, disguised himself as a eunuch, had made his escape. Little cared the black-browed youths and maidens about his parents. They merely remarked that if he only had a new coat, a red sash, a black lambskin cap, with dandified blue crown on his head, a turkey's sabre hanging by his side a whip in one hand and a pipe with handsome mountings in the other he would surpass all the young men but the pity was that the only thing poor peter had was a grey svitka with more holes in it than there are gold pieces in a jew's pocket and that was not the worst of it but this that courts had a daughter such a beauty as i think you can hardly have chance to see my deceased grandfather's aunt used to say and you know that it is easier for a woman to kiss the evil one than to call anybody a beauty without malice be it said that this cossack maiden's cheeks were as plump and fresh as the pinkest poppy when just bathed in god's dew and glowing it unfolds its petals and coquettes with the rising sun that her brows were like black cords such as our maidens buy nowadays for their crosses and ducats of the moscow peddlers who visit the villages with their baskets and evenly arched as though peeping into her clear eyes that her little mouth at sight of which the youths smacked their lips seemed made to emit the songs of nightingales that her hair black as the raven's wing and soft as young flax our maidens did not then plait their hair in clubs interwoven with bright pretty-hued ribbons fell in curls over her kuntush her blouse ah may i never intone another alleluia in the choir if i would not have kissed her in spite of the gray which is making its way all through the old wool which covers my pate and my old woman beside me like a thorn in my side well you know what happens when young men and maids live side by side in the twilight the heels of red boots were always visible in the place where Padorka chatted with her petrus but courts would never have suspected anything out of the way only one day it is evident that none but the evil one could have inspired him petrus took it into his head to kiss the cossack maiden's rosy lips with all his heart in the passage without first looking well about him and that same evil one made the son of a dog dream of the holy cross caused the old greybeard like a fool to open the cottage door at that same moment Quartz was petrified dropped his jaw and clutched at the door for support those unlucky kisses had completely stunned him it surprised him more than the blow of a pestle on the wall with which in our days the music generally drives out his intoxication for lack of fuses and powder recovering himself he took his grandfather's hunting whip from the wall and was about to belabor peter's back with it when Padorka's little six-year-old brother ivas rushed up from somewhere or other and grasping his father's legs with his little hands screamed out daddy daddy don't beat petrus what was to be done a father's heart is not made of stone hanging the whip again upon the wall he led him quietly from the house if you ever show yourself in my cottage again or even under the windows look out petro by heaven your black moustache will disappear 
and your black locks though wound twice about your ears will take leave of your pate or my name is not terenci Kors. so saying he gave him a little taste of his fist in the nape of his neck so that all grew dark before petrus and he flew headlong so there was an end of their kissing sorrow seized upon our doves and a rumor was rife in the village that a certain pole all embroidered with gold with mustaches sabres spurs and pockets jingling like the bells of the bag with which our sacristan terrace goes through the church every day had begun to frequent corza's house now it is well known why the father is visited when there is a black-browed daughter about so one day Pidorka burst into tears and clutched the hand of her ivis ivis my dear ivis my love fly to petrus my child of gold like an arrow from a bow tell him all i would have loved his brown eyes i would have kissed his white face but my fate decrees not so more than one towel have i wet with burning tears i am sad i am heavy at heart and my own father is my enemy i will not marry that pole whom i do not love tell him they are preparing a wedding but there will be no music at our wedding ecclesiastics will sing instead of pipes and kobzas i shall not dance with my bridegroom they will carry me out dark dark will be my dwelling of maple wood and instead of chimneys a cross will stand upon the roof petro stood petrified without moving from the spot when the innocent child lisped out Padorka's words to him and i unhappy man thought to go to the crimea and turkey win gold and return to thee my beauty but it may not be the evil eye has seen us i will have a wedding too dear little fish i too but no ecclesiastics will be at that wedding the black crow will caw instead of the pope over me the smooth field will be my dwelling the dark blue clouds my roof tree the eagle will claw out my brown eyes the rain will wash the cossack's bones and the whirlwinds will dry them but what am i of whom to whom am i complaining tis plain god willed it so if i am to be lost then so be it and he went straight to the tavern my late grandfather's aunt was somewhat surprised on seeing petrus in the tavern and at an hour when good men go to morning mass and she stared at him as though in a dream when he demanded a jug of brandy about half a pailful but the poor fellow tried in vain to drown his woe the vodka stung his tongue like nettles and tasted more bitter than wormwood he flung the jug from him upon the ground you have sorrowed enough cossack growled a bass voice behind him he looked round but of Reich. ugh what a face his hair was like a brush his eyes like those of a bull i know what you lack hither it is then he jingled a leather purse which hung from his girdle and smiled diabolically petro shuddered <laughs> yes how it shines he roared shaking out ducats into his hand <laughs> and how it jingles and i only ask one thing for a whole pile of such shiners it is the evil one exclaimed petro give them here i am ready for anything they struck hands upon it see here petro you are ripe just in time to-morrow is st john the baptist's day only on this one night in the year does the fern blossom delay not i will await thee at midnight in the bearer's ravine i do not believe that chickens await the hour when the woman brings their corn with as much anxiety as petrus awaited the evening and in fact he looked to see whether the shadows of the trees were not lengthening if the sun were not turning red toward setting and the longer he watched the more impatient he grew how long it was evidently god's day had lost its end somewhere and now the sun is gone 
the sky is red only on one side and it is already growing dark it grows colder in the fields it gets dusky and more dusky and at last quite dark at last with heart almost bursting from his bosom he set out on his way and cautiously descended through the dense woods into the deep hollow called the bear's ravine basavroyek was already waiting there it was so dark that you could not see a yard before you hand in hand they penetrated the thin marsh clinging to the luxuriant thorn bushes and stumbling at almost every step at last they reached an open spot petro looked about him he had never chanced to come there before here basavroyek halted do you see before you stand three hillocks there are a great many sorts of flowers upon them but may some power keep you from plucking even one of them but as soon as the fern blossoms seize it and look not round no matter what may seem to be going on behind thee petro wanted to ask and behold he was no longer there he approached the three hillocks where were the flowers he saw nothing the wild steppe grass darkled around and stifled everything in its luxuriance but the lightning flashed and before him stood a whole bed of flowers all wonderful all strange and there were also the simple fronds of fern petro doubted his senses and stood thoughtfully before them with both hands upon his sides what prodigy is this one can see these weeds ten times in a day what marvel is there about them was not devil's face laughing at me behold the tiny flower bud crimsons and moves as though alive it is a marvel in truth it moves and grows larger and larger and flushes like a burning coal the tiny star flashes up something bursts softly and the flower opens before his eyes like a flame lighting the others about it now is the time thought petro and extended his hand he sees hundreds of shaggy hands reach from behind him also for the flower and there is a running about from place to place in the rear he half shut his eyes plucked sharply at the stalk and the flower remained in his hand all became still upon a stump sat basavronik all blue like a corpse he moved not so much as a finger his eyes were immovably fixed on something visible to him alone his mouth was half opened and speechless all about nothing stirred ugh it was horrible but then a whistle was heard which made petro's heart grow cold within him and it seemed to him that the grass whispered and the flowers began to talk among themselves in delicate voices like little silver bells the trees wrestled in waving contention basavraik's face suddenly became full of life and his eyes sparkled the witch has just returned he muttered between his teeth see here petro a beauty will stand before you in a moment do whatever she commands if not you are lost forever then he parted the thorn bush with a knotty stick and before him stood a tiny izba on chicken's legs as they say basavraik smote it with his fist and the wall trembled a large black dog ran out to meet them and with a whine transforming itself into a cat flew straight at his eyes don't be angry don't be angry you old satan said basavraik employing such words as would have made a good man stop his ears behold instead of a cat an old woman with a face wrinkled like a baked apple and all bent into a bow her nose and chin were like a pair of nutcrackers a stunning beauty thought petro and cold chills ran down his back the witch tore the flower from his hand bent over and muttered over it for a long time sprinkling it with some kind of water sparks flew from her mouth froth appeared on her lips throw it away she said giving it back to petro petro threw it and what wonder was this 
the flower did not fall straight to the earth but for a long while twinkled like a fiery ball through the darkness and swam through the air like a boat at last it began to sink lower and lower and fell so far away that the little star hardly larger than a poppy seed was barely visible here croaked the old woman in a dull voice and basavradic giving him a spade said dig here petro here you will see more gold than you or courts ever dreamed of petro spat on his hands seized the spade applied his foot and turned up the earth a second a third a fourth time there was something hard the spade clinked and would go no farther then his eyes began to distinguish a small iron-bound coffer he tried to seize it but the chest began to sink into the earth deeper farther and deeper still and behind him he heard a laugh more like a serpent's hiss no you shall not see the gold until you procure human blood said the witch and led up to him a child of six covered with a white sheet indicating by a sign that he was to cut off his head petro was stunned a trifle indeed to cut off a man's or even an innocent child's head for no reason whatever in wrath he tore off the sheet enveloping his head and behold before him stood ivas and the poor child crossed his little hands and hung his head petro flew upon the witch with a knife like a madman and was on the point of laying hands on her what did you promise for the girl thundered basavryak and like a shot he was on his back the witch stamped her foot a blue flame flashed from the earth it illumined it all inside and it was if moulded of crystal and all that was within the earth became visible as if in the palm of the hand ducats precious stones and chests and kettles were piled in heaps beneath the very spot they stood on his eyes burned his mind grew troubled he grasped the knife like a madman and the innocent blood spurted into his eyes diabolical laughter resounded on all sides misshaped monsters flew past him in herds the witch fastening her hands in the headless trunk like a wolf drank its blood all went round in his head collecting all his strength he set out to run everything turned red before him the trees seemed steeped in blood and burned and groaned the sky glowed and glowered burning points like lightning flickered before his eyes utterly exhausted he rushed into his miserable hovel and fell to the ground like a log a death-like sleep overpowered him two days and two nights did petro sleep without once awakening when he came to himself on the third day he looked long at all the corners of his hut but in vain did he endeavor to recollect his memory was like a miser's pocket from which you cannot entice a quarter of a kopeck stretching himself he heard something clash at his feet he looked two bags of gold then only as if in a dream he recollected that he had been seeking some treasure that something had frightened him in the woods but at what price had he obtained it and how he could by no means understand kor saw the sacks and was mollified such a petrus quite unheard of yes and did i not love him was he not to me as my own son and the old fellow carried on his fiction until it reduced him to tears Padorka began to tell him how some passing gypsies had stolen ivas but petro could not even recall him to such a degree had the devil's influence darkened his mind there was no reason for delay the pole was dismissed and the wedding feast prepared rolls were baked towels and handkerchiefs embroidered the young people were seated at table the wedding loaf was cut banduras cymbals pipes cobsy sounded and pleasure was rife a wedding in the olden times was not like one of the present day 
my grandfather's aunt used to tell what doings how the maidens in festive headdresses of yellow blue and pink ribbons above which they bound gold braid in thin chemisettes embroidered on all the seams with red silk and strewn with tiny silver flowers in morocco shoes with high iron heels danced the gorlitza as swimmingly as peacocks and as wildly as a whirlwind how the youths with their ship-shaped caps upon their heads the crowns of gold brocade with a little slit at the nape where the hairnet peeped through and two horns projecting one in front and another behind of the very finest black lambskin in contusias of the finest blue silk with red borders stepped forward one by one their arms akimbo in stately form and executed the gopak how the lads in tall cossack caps and light cloth svitkas girt with silver embroidered belts their short pipes in their teeth skipped before them and talked nonsense even courts could not contain himself as he gazed at the young people from getting gay in his old age bandura in hand alternately puffing at his pipe and singing a brandy glass upon his head the greybeard began the national dance among loud shouts from the merrymakers what will not people devise in merry mood they even began to disguise their faces they did not look like human beings they are not to be compared with the disguises which we have at our weddings nowadays what do they do now why imitate gypsies and moscow peddlers no then one used to dress himself as a jew another as the devil they would begin by kissing each other and ended by seizing each other by the hair god be with them you laughed till you held your sides they dressed themselves in turkish and tartar garments all upon them glowed like a conflagration and then they began to joke and play pranks well then away with the saints an amusing thing happened to my grandfather's aunt who was at this wedding she was dressed in a voluminous tartar robe and wine-glass in hand was entertaining the company the evil one instigated one man to pour vodka over her from behind another at the same moment evidently not by accident struck a light and touched it to her the flame flashed up poor aunt in terror flung her robe from her before them all screams laughter jest arose as if at a fair in a word the old folks could not recall so merry a wedding Pedorka and petrus began to live like a gentleman and lady there was plenty of everything and everything was handsome but honest people shook their heads when they looked at their way of living from the devil no good can come they unanimously agreed whence except from the tempter of orthodox people came this wealth where else could he get such a lot of gold why on the very day that he got rich did basavraik vanish as if into thin air say if you can that people imagine things in fact a month had not passed and no one would have recognized petrus why what had happened to him god knows he sits in one spot and says no word to anyone he thinks continually and seems to be trying to recall something when Podorka succeeds in getting him to speak he seems to forget himself carries on a conversation and even grows cheerful but if he inadvertently glances at the sacks stop stop i have forgotten he cries and again plunges into reverie and again strives to recall something sometimes when he has sat long in a place it seems to him as though it was just coming just coming back to mind and again all fades away it seems as if he is sitting in the tavern they bring him vodka vodka stings him vodka is repulsive to him someone comes along and strikes him on the shoulder but beyond that everything is veiled in darkness before him 
the perspiration streams down his face and he sits exhausted in the same place what did not pidorka do she consulted the sorceress and they poured out fear and brewed stomach ache to pour out fear is done with us in case of fear when it is desired to know what caused it melted lead or wax is poured into water and the object whose form it assumes is the one which frightened the sick person after this the fear departs sonya schnitzna is brewed for giddiness and pain in the bowels to this end a bit of stump is burned thrown into a jug and turned upside down into a bowl filled with water which is placed on the patient's stomach after an incantation he is given a spoonful of this water to drink but all to no avail and so the summer passed many a cossack had mowed and reaped many a cossack more enterprising than the rest had set off upon an expedition flocks of ducks were already crowding our marshes but there was not even a hint of improvement it was red upon the steppes ricks of grain like cossacks caps dotted the fields here and there on the highway were to be encountered wagons loaded with brushwood and logs the ground had become more solid and in places was touched with frost already had the snow begun to besprinkle the sky and the branches of the trees were covered with rime like rabbit skin already on frosty days the red-breasted finch hopped about on the snow heaps like a foppish polish nobleman and picked out grains of corn and children with huge sticks chased wooden tops upon the ice while their fathers lay quietly on the stove issuing forth at intervals with lighted pipes in their lips to growl in regular fashion at the orthodox frost or to take the air and thresh the grain spread out in the barn at last the snow began to melt and the ice rind slipped away but petro remained the same and the longer it went on the more morose he grew he sat in the middle of the cottage as though nailed to the spot with the sacks of gold at his feet he grew shy his hair grew long he became terrible and still he thought of but one thing still he tried to recall something and got angry and ill-tempered because he could not recall it often rising wildly from his seat he gesticulates violently fixes his eye on something as though desirous of catching it his lips move as though desirous of uttering some long-forgotten word and remains speechless fury takes possession of him he gnaws and bites his hands like a man half crazy and in his vexation tears out his hair by the handful until calming down he falls into forgetfulness as it were and again begins to recall and is again seized with fury and fresh tortures what visitation of god is this Padorka was neither dead nor alive at first it was horrible to her to remain alone in the cottage but in course of time the poor woman grew accustomed to her sorrow but it was impossible to recognize the padorka of former days no blush no smile she was thin and worn with grief and had wept her bright eyes away once some one who evidently took pity on her advised her to go to the witch who dwelt in the bear's ravine and enjoyed the reputation of being able to cure every disease in the world she determined to try this last remedy word by word she persuaded the old woman to come to her this was st john's eve as it chanced petro lay insensible on the bench and did not observe the newcomer little by little he rose and looked about him suddenly he trembled in every limb as though he were on the scaffold his hair rose upon his head and he laughed such a laugh as pierced pidorka's heart with fear i have remembered remembered he cried in terrible joy and swinging a hatchet round his head he flung it at the old woman with all his might the hatchet penetrated the oaken door two vershuk about three inches and a half the old woman disappeared and a child of seven in a white blouse with covered head stood 
in the middle of the cottage the sheet flew off ivas cried pidorka and ran to him but the apparition became covered from head to foot with blood and illumined the whole room with red light she ran into the passage in her terror but on recovering herself a little wished to help him in vain the door had slammed to behind her so securely that she could not open it people ran up and began to knock they broke in the door as though there was but one mind among them the whole cottage was full of smoke and just in the middle where petrus had stood was a heap of ashes from which smoke was still rising they flung themselves upon the sacks only broken potsherds lay there instead of ducats the cossacks stood with staring eyes and open mouths not daring to move a hair as if rooted to the earth such terror did this wonder inspire in them i do not remember what happened next Pidorka took a vow to go upon a pilgrimage collected the property left her by her father and in a few days it was as if she had never been in the village whither she had gone no one could tell officious old women would have dispatched her to the same place whither petro had gone but a cossack from kiev reported that he had seen in a cloister a nun withered to a mere skeleton who prayed unceasingly and her fellow villagers recognized her as pidorka by all the signs that no one had ever heard her utter a word that she had come on foot and had brought a frame for the icon of god's mother set with such brilliant stones that all were dazzled at the sight but this was not the end if you please on the same day that the evil one made way with petrus basavryuk appeared again but all fled from him they knew what sort of bird he was none else than satan who had assumed a human form in order to unearth treasures and since treasures do not yield to unclean hands he seduced the young that same year all deserted their earth huts and collected in a village but even there there was no peace on account of that accursed basavryuk my late grandfather's aunt said that he was particularly angry with her because she had abandoned her former tavern and tried with all his might to revenge himself upon her once the elders were assembled in the tavern and as the saying goes were arranging the precedents at the table in the middle of which was placed a small roasted lamb shame to say they chattered about this that and the other among the rest about various marvels and strange things well they saw something it would have been nothing if only one had seen it but all saw it and it was this the sheep raised his head his goggling eyes became alive and sparkled and the black bristling moustache which appeared for one instant made a significant gesture at those present all at once recognized basavryuk's countenance in the sheep's head my grandfather's aunt thought it was on the point of asking for vodka the worthy elders seized their hats and hastened home another time the church starus himself who was fond of an occasional private interview with my grandfather's brandy glass had not succeeded in getting to the bottom twice when he beheld the glass bowing very low to him satan take you let us make the sign of the cross over you and the same marvel happened to his better half she had just begun to mix the dough in a huge kneading trough when suddenly the trough sprang up stop stop where are you going putting its arms akimbo with dignity it went skipping all about the cottage you may laugh but it was no laughing matter to our grandfathers and in vain did father athanasi go through all the village with holy water and chase the devil through all the streets with his brush and my late grandfather's aunt long complained that as soon as it was dark some one came knocking at her door and scratching at the wall well all appears to be quiet now in the place where our village stands but it was not so very long ago my father was still alive that i remember how a good man could not pass the ruined tavern which a dishonest race had long managed for their own interest 
from the smoke-blackened chimneys smoke poured out in a pillar and rising high in the air as if to take an observation rolled off like a cap scattering burning coals over the step and satan the son of a dog should not be mentioned sobbed so pitifully in his lair that the startled ravens rose in flocks from the neighboring oak wood and flew through the air with wild cries end of st john's eve recording by gary grenholm section five of stories by foreign authors russian authors this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Stories by Foreign Authors, Russian Authors, by Various. An Old Acquaintance by Leof N. Tolstoy. Translated by N. H. Dole. Part 1 our division had been out in the field the work in hand was accomplished we had cut a way through the forest and each day we were expecting from headquarters orders for our return to the fort our division of field pieces was stationed at the top of a steep mountain crest which was terminated by the swift mountain river mechik and had to command the plain that stretched before us here and there on this picturesque plain out of the reach of gunshot now and then especially at evening groups of mounted mountaineers showed themselves attracted by curiosity to ride up and view the russian camp the evening was clear mild and fresh as it is apt to be in december in the caucasus the sun was setting behind the steep chain of the mountains at the left and threw rosy rays upon the tents scattered over the slope upon the soldiers moving about and upon our two guns which seemed to crane their necks as they rested motionless on the earthwork two paces from us. The infantry picket, stationed on the knoll at the left, stood in perfect silhouette against the light of the sunset. No less distinct were the stack of muskets, the form of the sentry, the groups of soldiers, and the smoke of the smoldering campfire. At the right and left of the slope, on the black, sodden earth, the tents gleamed white, and behind the tents, black, stood the bare trunks of the platane forest which rang with the incessant sound of axes the crackling of the bonfires and the crashing of the trees as they fell under the axes the bluish smoke arose from tobacco pipes on all sides and vanished in the transparent blue of the frosty sky by the tents and on the lower ground around the arms rushed the cossacks dragoons and artillerists with great galloping and snorting of horses as they returned from getting water it began to freeze all sounds were heard with extraordinary distinctness and one could see an immense distance across the plain through the clear rare atmosphere the groups of the enemy their curiosity at seeing the soldiers satisfied quietly galloped off across the fields still yellow with the golden corn stubble toward their owls or villages which were visible beyond the forest with the tall posts of the cemeteries and the smoke rising in the air our tent was pitched not far from the guns on a place high and dry from which we had a remarkably extended view near the tent on a cleared space around the battery itself we had our games of skittles or chushki the obliging soldiers had made for us rustic benches and tables on account of all these amusements the artillery officers our comrades and a few infantry men liked to gather of an evening around our battery and the place came to be called the club as the evening was fine, the best players had come, and we were amusing ourselves with skittles. Ensign D., Lieutenant O., and myself had played two games in succession, and to the common satisfaction and amusement of all the spectators, officers, soldiers, and servants, who were watching us from their tents, we had twice carried the winning party on our backs from one end of the ground to the other. Especially droll was the situation of the huge fat Captain S., who, puffing and smiling good-naturedly, with legs dragging on the ground, rode pick a on the feeble little Lieutenant O. When it grew somewhat later, the servants brought three glasses of tea for the six men of us, and not a spoon. 
and we who had finished our game came to the plated settees there was standing near them a small bow-legged man a stranger to us in a sheepskin jacket and a popka or circassian cap with a long overhanging white crown as soon as we came near where he stood he took a few irresolute steps and put on his cap and several times he seemed to make up his mind to come and meet us and then stopped again but after deciding probably that it was impossible to remain irresolute the stranger took off his cap and going in a circuit around us approached captain s ah guscantellini how is it old man said s still smiling good-naturedly under the influence of his ride guscantini as s called him instantly replaced his cap and made a motion as though to thrust his hands into the pockets of his jacket but on the side toward me there was no pocket in the jacket and his small red hand fell into an awkward position i felt a strong desire to make out who this man was was he a younker or a degraded officer and not realizing that my gaze that is the gaze of a strange officer disconcerted him i continued to stare at his dress and appearance i judged that he was about thirty his small round gray eyes had a sleepy expression and at the same time gazed calmly out from under the dirty white lambskin of his cap which hung down over his face his thick irregular nose standing out between his sunken cheeks gave evidence of emaciation that was the result of illness and not natural his restless lips barely covered by a sparse soft whitish mustache were constantly changing their shape as though they were trying to assume now one expression now another but all these expressions seemed to be endless and his face retained one predominating expression of timidity and fright around his thin neck where the veins stood out was tied a green woolen scarf tucked into his jacket his fur jacket or polishbok was worn bare short and had dog fur sewed on the collar and on the false pockets the trousers were checkered of ash gray color and his sapogi had short unblacked military bootlegs i beg of you do not disturb yourself said i when he for the second time timidly glancing at me had taken off his cap he bowed to me with an expression of gratitude replaced his hat and drawing from his pocket a dirty chintz tobacco pouch with lacings began to roll a cigarette i myself had not been long a younker an elderly younker and as i was incapable as yet of being good-naturedly serviceable to my younger comrades and without means i knew well all the moral difficulties of this situation for a proud man no longer young and i sympathized with all men who found themselves in such a situation and i endeavored to make clear to myself their character and rank and the tendencies of their intellectual peculiarities in order to judge of the degree of their moral sufferings this younker or degraded officer judging by his restless eyes and that intentionally constant variation of expression which i noticed in him was a man very far from stupid and extremely egotistical and therefore much to be pitied captain s invited us to play another game of skittles with the stakes to consist not only of the usual pick-a-back ride of the winning party but also of a few bottles of red wine rum sugar cinnamon and cloves for the mulled wine which that winter on account of the cold was greatly popular in our division guscantini as s again called him was also invited to take part but before the game began the man struggling between gratification because he had been invited and a certain timidity drew captain s aside and began to say something in a whisper the good-natured captain punched him in the ribs with his big fat hand and replied loud enough to be heard not at all old fellow i assure you when the game was over and that side in which the stranger whose rank was so low had taken part had come out winners and it fell to his lot to ride on one of our officers ensign d the ensign grew red in the face he went to the little divan and offered the stranger a cigarette by way of a compromise while they were ordering the mulled wine and in the steward's tent were heard assiduous preparations on the part of nikita who had sent an orderly for cinnamon and cloves and the shadow of his back was alternately lengthening and shortening on the dingy sides of the tent we men seven in all sat around on the benches and while we took turns in drinking tea from the three glasses and gazed out over the plain which was now beginning to glow in the twilight 
we talked and laughed over the various incidents of the game the stranger in the fur jacket took no share in the conversation obstinately refused to drink the tea which i several times offered him and as he sat there on the ground in tartar fashion occupied himself in making cigarettes of fine cut tobacco and smoking them one after another evidently not so much for his own satisfaction as to give himself the appearance of a man with something to do when it was remarked that the summons to return was expected on the morrow and that there might be an engagement he lifted himself on his knees and addressing captain b only said that he had been at the adjutant's and had himself written the order for the return on the next day we all said nothing while he was speaking and notwithstanding the fact that he was so bashful we begged him to repeat this most interesting piece of news he repeated what he had said adding only that he had been staying at the adjutant's since he made it his home there when the order came look here old fellow if you are not telling us false i shall have to go to my company and give some orders for tomorrow said captain s no why it may be i am sure stammered the stranger but suddenly stopped and apparently feeling himself affronted contracted his brows and muttering something between his teeth again began to roll a cigarette but the fine-cut tobacco in his chintz pouch began to show signs of giving out and he asked s to lend him a little cigarette we kept on for a considerable time with that monotonous military chatter which everyone who has ever been on an expedition will appreciate all of us with one and the same expression complaining of the dullness and length of the expedition in one and the same fashion sitting in judgment on our superiors and all of us likewise as we had done many times before praising one comrade pitying another wondering how much this one had gained how much that one had lost and so on and so on here fellows this adjutant of ours is completely broken up said captain s at headquarters he was everlastingly on the winning side no matter whom he sat down with he'd rake in everything but now for two months past he has been losing all the time the present expedition hasn't been lucky for him i think he has got away with two thousand silver rubles and five hundred rubles worth of articles the carpet that he wore at mukin's nikitin's pistols sada's gold watch which voronsov gave him he has lost it all the truth of the matter in his case said lieutenant o was that he used to cheat everybody it was impossible to play with him he cheated everyone but now it's all gone up in his pipe and here captain s laughed good-naturedly our friend guskov here lives with him he hasn't quite lost him yet that's so isn't it old fellow guskov tried to laugh it was a melancholy sickly laugh which completely changed the expression of his countenance till this moment it had seemed to me that i had seen and known this man before and besides the name of guskov by which captain s called him was familiar to me but how and when i had seen and known him i actually could not remember yes said guskov incessantly putting his hand to his mustaches but instantly dropping it again without touching them pavel dmitrievich's luck has been against him in this expedition such a vine de malheur he added in a careful but pure french pronunciation again giving me to think that i had seen him and seen him often somewhere i know pavel dmitrievich very well he has great confidence in me he proceeded to say he and i are old friends that is he is fond of me he explained evidently fearing that it might be taken as presumption for him to claim old friendship with the adjutant pavel dmitrievich plays admirably but now strange as it may seem it's all up with him he is just about perfectly ruined la chance a tourne he added addressing himself particularly to me at first we had listened to guskov with condescending attention but as soon as he made use of that second french phrase we all involuntarily turned from him i have played with him a thousand times and we agreed then that it was strange said lieutenant o with peculiar emphasis on the word strange i never once won a rouble from him why was it when i used to win of others pavel dmitrievich plays admirably i have known him for a long time said i in fact i had known the adjutant for several years more than once i had seen him in the full swing of a game surrounded by officers and i had remarked his handsome rather gloomy and always passionless calm face his deliberate mallow russian pronunciation 
his handsome belongings and horses his bold manly figure and above all his skill and self-restraint in carrying on the game accurately and agreeably more than once i am sorry to say as i looked at his plump white hands with a diamond ring on the index finger passing out one card after another i grew angry with that ring with his white hands with the whole of the adjutant's person and evil thoughts on his account arose in my mind but as i afterwards reconsidered the matter coolly i persuaded myself that he played more skilfully than all with whom he happened to play the more so because as i heard his general observations concerning the game how one ought not to back out when one had laid the smallest stake how one ought not to leave off in certain cases as the first rule for honest men and so forth and so forth it was evident that he was always on the winning side merely from the fact that he played more sagaciously and coolly than the rest of us and now it seemed that this self-reliant careful player had been stripped not only of his money but of his effects which marks the lowest depths of loss for an officer he always had devilish good luck with me said lieutenant o i made a vow never to play with him again what a marvel you are old fellow said s nodding at me and addressing o you lost three hundred silver roubles that's what you lost to him more than that said the lieutenant savagely and now you have come to your senses it is rather late in the day old man for the rest of us have known for a long time that he was the cheat of the regiment said s with difficulty restraining his laughter and feeling very well satisfied with his fabrication here is guskoff right here he fixes his cards for him that's the reason of the friendship between them old man and captain s shaking all over burst out into such a hearty ha 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 that he spilt the glass of mulled wine which he was holding in his hand on guskoff's pale emaciated face there showed something like a color he opened his mouth several times raised his hands to his mustaches and once more dropped them to his side where the pocket should have been stood up and then sat down again and finally in an unnatural voice said to s it's no joke nikolai ivanovitch for you to say such things before people who don't know me and who see me in this unlined jacket because his voice failed him and again his small red hands with their dirty nails went from his jacket to his face touching his mustache his hair his nose rubbing his eyes or needlessly scratching his cheek as to saying that everybody knows it old fellow continued s thoroughly satisfied with his jest and not heeding guskoff's complaint guskoff was still trying to say something and placing the palm of his right hand on his left knee in a most unnatural position and gazing at s he had an appearance of smiling contemptuously no i said to myself as i noticed that smile of his i have not only seen him but have spoken with him somewhere you and i have met somewhere said i to him when under the influence of the common silence s's laughter began to calm down guskoff's mobile face suddenly lighted up and his eyes for the first time with a truly joyous expression rested upon me why i recognized you immediately he replied in french in forty eight i had the pleasure of meeting you quite frequently in moscow at my sister's i had to apologize for not recognizing him at first in that costume and in that new garb he arose came to me and with his moist hand irresolutely and weakly seized my hand and sat down by me instead of looking at me though he apparently seemed glad to see me he gazed with an expression of unfriendly bravado at the officers either because i recognized in him a man whom i had met a few years before in a dress coat in a parlor or because he was suddenly raised in his own opinion by the fact of being recognized at all events it seemed to me that his face and even his motions completely changed they now expressed lively intelligence a childish self-satisfaction in the consciousness of such intelligence and a certain contemptuous indifference so that i confess notwithstanding the pitiable position in which he found himself my old acquaintance did not so much excite sympathy in me as it did a sort of unfavorable sentiment i now vividly remembered our first meeting in 1848 while i was staying at moscow i frequently went to the house of ivashin who from childhood had been an old friend of mine his wife was an agreeable hostess a charming woman as everybody said but she never pleased me the winter that i knew her she often spoke with hardly concealed pride of her brother 
who had shortly before completed his course, and promised to be one of the most fashionable and popular young men in the best society of Petersburg, as I knew by reputation the father of the Guskoffs, who was very rich and had a distinguished position, and, as I knew also the sisters' ways, I felt some prejudice against meeting the young man. On the evening when I was at Eva Sheen's, I saw a short, thoroughly pleasant-looking young man in a black coat, white vest, and necktie. My host hastened to make me acquainted with him. The young man, evidently dressed for a ball, with his cap in his hand, was standing before Ivashin, and was eagerly but politely arguing with him about a common friend of ours, who had distinguished himself at the time of the Hungarian campaign. He said that this acquaintance was not at all a hero or a man born for war, as was said of him, but was simply a clever and cultivated man. I recollect I took part in the argument against Guskoff, and went to the extreme of declaring also that intellect and cultivation always bore an inverse relation to bravery and i recollect how guskoff pleasantly and cleverly pointed out to me that bravery was necessarily the result of intellect and a decided degree of development a statement which i who considered myself an intellectual and cultivated man could not in my heart of hearts agree with i recollect that towards the close of our conversation madame ivashina introduced me to her brother and he with a condescending smile offered me his little hand, on which he had not yet had time to draw his kid gloves, and weakly and irresolutely pressed my hand as he did now. Though I had been prejudiced against Guskoff, I could not help granting that he was in the right, and agreeing with his sister that he was really a clever and agreeable young man, who ought to have great success in society. He was extraordinarily neat, beautifully dressed, and fresh, and had affectedly modest manners, and a thoroughly youthful, almost childish appearance, on account of which you could not help excusing his expression of self-sufficiency, though it modified the impression of his mightiness caused by his intellectual face and especially his smile. It is said that he had great success that winter with the high-born ladies of Moscow. As I saw him at his sister's, I could only infer how far this was true by the feelings of pleasure and contentment constantly excited in me by his youthful appearance, and by his sometimes indiscreet anecdotes. He and I met half a dozen times, and talked a good deal. Or rather, he talked a good deal, and I listened. He spoke for the most part in French, always with a good accent, very fluently and ornately, and he had the skill of drawing others gently and politely into the conversation. As a general thing, he behaved toward all, and toward me, in a somewhat supercilious manner, and I felt that he was perfectly right in this way of treating people. I always feel that way in regard to men who are firmly convinced that they ought to treat me superciliously, and who are comparative strangers to me. Now, as he sat with me and gave me his hand, I keenly recalled in him that same old haughtiness of expression, and it seemed to me that he did not properly appreciate his position of official inferiority as, in the presence of the officers, he asked me what I had been doing in all that time, and how I happened to be there. In spite of the fact that I invariably made my replies in Russian, he kept putting his questions in French, expressing himself, as before, in remarkably correct language. About himself, he said fluently that after his unhappy, wretched story, what the story was I did not know, and he did not yet tell me, he had been three months under arrest and then had been sent to the caucasus to the north regiment and now had been serving three years as a soldier in that regiment you would not believe he said to me in french how much i have to suffer in these regiments from the society of the officers still it is a pleasure to me that i used to know the adjutant of whom we were just speaking he is a good man it's a fact he remarked condescendingly i live with him and that's something of a relief for me Yes, my dear, the days fly by, but they aren't all alike. He added, and suddenly hesitated, reddened, and stood up, as he caught sight of the adjutant himself coming toward us. It is such a pleasure to meet such a man as you, said Guskoff to me in a whisper as he turned from me. I should like very, very much to have a long talk with you. I said that I should be very happy to talk with him, but in reality I confess that Guskoff excited in me a sort of dull pity that was not akin to sympathy. I had a presentiment that I should feel a constraint in a private conversation with him, but still I was anxious to learn from him several things, 
and above all why it was when his father had been so rich that he was in poverty as was evident by his dress and appearance the adjutant greeted us all including guskoff and sat down by me in the seat which the cashiered officer had just vacated pavel dmitrievich who had always been calm and leisurely a genuine gambler and a man of means was now very different from what he had been in the flowery days of his success he seemed to be in haste to go somewhere kept constantly glancing at everybody and it was not five minutes before he proposed to lieutenant o who had sworn off from playing to set up a small faro bank lieutenant o refused under the pretext of having to attend to his duties but in reality because as he knew that the adjutant had few possessions and little money left he did not feel himself justified in risking his three hundred roubles against a hundred or even less which the adjutant might stake well pavel dmitrievich said the lieutenant anxious to avoid a repetition of the invitation is it true what they tell us that we return tomorrow i don't know replied the adjutant orders came to be in readiness but if it's true then you'd better play a game i would wager my kabarda cloak no today already it's a gray one never been worn but if you prefer play for money how is that yes but i should be willing pray don't think that said lieutenant o answering the implied suspicion but as there may be a raid or some movement i must go to bed early the adjutant stood up and thrusting his hands into his pockets started to go across the grounds his face assumed its ordinary expression of coldness and pride which i admired in him won't you have a glass of mulled wine i asked him that might be acceptable and he came back to me but guskoff politely took the glass from me and handed it to the adjutant striving at the same time not to look at him but as he did not notice the tent rope he stumbled over it and fell on his hand dropping the glass what a bungler exclaimed the adjutant still holding out his hand for the glass everybody burst out laughing not excepting guskoff who was rubbing his hand on his sore knee which he had somehow struck as he fell that's the way the bear waited on the hermit continued the adjutant it's the way he waits on me every day he has pulled up all the tent pins he's always tripping up Guskoff, not hearing him, apologized to us, and glanced toward me with a smile of almost noticeable melancholy, as though saying that I alone could understand him. He was pitiable to see, but the adjutant, his protector, seemed, on that very account, to be severe on his messmate, and did not try to put him at his ease. "'Well, you're a graceful lad. Where did you think you were going?' "'Well, who can help tripping over these pins, Pavel Dmitrievich?' said Guskoff. "'You tripped over them yourself the other day.' I, old man, I am not of the rank and file, and such gracefulness is not expected of me. He can be lazy, said Captain S., keeping the ball rolling, but low-rank men have to make their legs fly. Ill-timed jest, said Guskoff, almost in a whisper, and casting down his eyes. The adjutant was evidently vexed with his messmate. He listened with inquisitive attention to every word that he said he'll have to be sent out into ambuscade again said he addressing s and pointing to the cashiered officer well there'll be some more tears said s laughing guskoff no longer looked at me but acted as though he were going to take some tobacco from his pouch though there had been none there for some time get ready for the ambuscade old man said s addressing him with shouts of laughter today the scouts have brought the news there'll be an attack on the camp tonight so it's necessary to designate the trusty lads guskoff's face showed a fleeting smile as though he were preparing to make some reply but several times he cast a supplicating look at s well you know i have been and i'm ready to go again if i am sent he said hastily then you'll be sent well i'll go isn't that all right yes as at arguna you deserted the ambuscade and threw away your gun said the adjutant and turning from him he began to tell us the orders for the next day as a matter of fact we expected from the enemy a cannonade of the camp that night and the next day some sort of diversion while we were still chatting about various subjects of general interest the adjutant as though from a sudden and unexpected impulse proposed to lieutenant o to have a little game the lieutenant most unexpectedly consented and together with s and the ensign they went off to the adjutant's tent where there was a folding green table with cards on it the captain the commander of our division went to our tent to sleep the other gentlemen also separated and guskoff and i were left alone i was not mistaken it was really very uncomfortable for me to have a tete-a-tete -tete with him 
I arose involuntarily and began to promenade up and down on the battery. Guskov walked in silence by my side, hastily and awkwardly wheeling around so as not to delay or incommode me. Do I not annoy you? he asked in a soft, mournful voice. So far as I could see his face in the dim light, it seemed to me deeply thoughtful and melancholy. Not at all, I replied. But as he did not immediately begin to speak, and as I did not know what to say to him, we walked in silence a considerably long time. End of section 5section six of stories by foreign authors russian authors this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by k hand stories by foreign authors russian authors by various an old acquaintance by leof n tolstoy translated by n h dole Part two. The twilight had now absolutely changed into dark night. Over the black profile of the mountains gleamed the bright evening heat lightning. Over our heads in the light blue frosty sky twinkled the little stars. On all sides gleamed the ruddy flames of the smoking watch fires. Near us the white tents stood out in contrast to the frowning blackness of our earthworks. The light from the nearest watch-fire, around which our servants, engaged in quiet conversation, were warming themselves, occasionally flashed on the brass of our heavy guns, and fell on the form of the sentry, who, wrapped in his cloak, paced with measured tread along the battery. "'You cannot imagine what a delight it is for me to talk with such a man as you are,' said Guskov, although as yet he had not spoken a word to me. Only one who had been in my position could appreciate it. I did not know how to reply to him, and we again relapsed into silence, although it was evident that he was anxious to talk and have me listen to him. "'Why were you—why did you suffer this?' I inquired at last, not being able to invent any better way of breaking the ice. "'Why, didn't you hear about this wretched business from Metinin? "'Yes, a duel, I believe. I did not hear much about it,' I replied. You see, I have been for some time in the Caucasus. No, it wasn't a duel, but it was a stupid and horrid story. I will tell you about it if you don't know. It happened that the same year that I met you at my sister's I was living at Petersburg. I must tell you that I had then what they call une position dans le monde, a position good enough if it was not brilliant. Mon père me donné ten thousand par an. In forty-nine I was promised a place in the embassy at Turin. My uncle on my mother's side had influence, and was always ready to do a great deal for me. That sort of thing is all past now. J'étais recou dans la mouillère société de Petersburg. I might have aspired to any girl in the city. I was well educated, as we all are who come from the school, but was not especially cultivated. To be sure I read a good deal afterward. Mais j'avais ce tour, you know, ces jargons de moon, however it came about. I was looked upon as a leading light among the young men of Petersburg. What raised me more than all in common estimation, c'est cette liaison avec Madame de, about which a great deal was said in Petersburg, but I was frightfully young at that time, and did not prioritize these advantages very highly. I was simply young and stupid. What more did I need? Just then, that Metinin had some notoriety. And Guskov went on in the same fashion to relate to me the history of his misfortunes, which I will omit, as it would not be at all interesting. Two months I remained under arrest, he continued, absolutely alone, and what thoughts did I not have during that time? But you know, when it was all over, as though every tie had been broken with the past, then it became easier for me. Mon père. You have heard tell of him, of course, a man of iron will and strong convictions, il m'a desserite, and broken off all intercourse with me. According to his convictions, he had to do as he did, and I don't blame him at all. He was consistent. Consequently, I have not taken a step to induce him to change his mind. My sister was abroad. 
Madame de is the only one who wrote to me when I was released, and she sent me assistance. But you understand that I could not accept it, so that I had none of those little things which makes one's position a little easier. You know, books, linen, food, nothing at all. At this time I thought things over and over, and began to look at life with different eyes. For instance, this noise, this society gossip about me in Petersburg, did not interest me, did not flatter me. It all seemed to me ridiculous. I felt that I myself had been to blame. I was young and indiscreet, I had spoiled my career, and I only thought how I might get into the right track again. And I felt that I had strength and energy enough for it. After my arrest, as I told you, I was sent here, to the Caucasus, to the North Regiment. I thought, he went on to say, all the time becoming more and more animated, I thought that here, in the Caucasus, la vie de camp, the simple honest men with whom I should associate, and war and danger, would all admirably agree with my mental state, so that I might begin a new life. They will see me under fire. I shall make myself liked. I shall be respected for my real self. The cross, non-commissioned officer, they will relieve me of my fine, and I shall get up again. Et vous savez avec ce prestige du malheur. But, quel disenchantment! You can't imagine how I have been deceived. You know what sort of men the officers of our regiment are. He did not speak for some little time, waiting as it appeared for me to tell him that I knew the society of our officers here was bad, but I made him no reply. It went against my grain that he should expect me because I knew French, forsooth, to be obliged to take issue with the society of the officers, which, during my long residence in the Caucasus, I had enough time to appreciate fully, and for which I had far higher respect than for the society from which Mr. Guskoff had sprung. I wanted to tell him so, but his position constrained me. In the North Regiment, the society of the officers is a thousand times worse than it is here, he continued. I hope that it is saying a good deal. J'espère que c'est beaucoup dire. That is, you cannot imagine what it is. I am not speaking of the Yunkers and the soldiers. That is horrible, it is so bad. At first they received me very kindly, that is absolutely the truth. But when they saw that I could not help despising them, you know, in these inconceivably small circumstances, they saw that I was a man absolutely different, standing far above them, they got angry with me and began to put various little humiliations on me. You haven't an idea what I had to suffer. Then this forced relationship with the Yunkers, and especially with the small means that I had, I lacked everything. I had only what my sister used to send me, and here's proof for you. As much as it made me suffer, I, with my character, avec ma fierte, j'ai écrit à mon père, begged him to send me something. I understand how living four years of such a life may make a man like our cashiered Drumoff, who drinks with soldiers, and writes notes to all the officers asking them to loan him three rubles, and signing it, to avou Drumoff. One must have such a character as I have, to not be mired in the least, by such a horrible position. For some time he walked in silence by my side. Have you a cigarette? he asked me. And so I stayed right where I was? Yes. I could not endure it physically, because though we were wretched, cold, and ill-fed, I lived like a common soldier, but still the officers had some sort of consideration for me. I had still some prestige that they regarded. I wasn't sent out on guard, nor for drill. I could not have stood that. But morally, my sufferings were frightful, and especially because I didn't see any escape from my position. I wrote my uncle, begged him to get me transferred to my present regiment, which at least sees some service. And I thought here that Pavel Dmitrievich, qui est le fil de l'intendant de mon père, might be of some use to me. My uncle did this for me. I was transferred. After that regiment, this one seemed to me a collection of chamberlains. Then Pavel Dmitrievich was here. He knew who I was, and I was splendidly received. At my uncle's request, a Guskov, vous savez. But I forgot that with these men without cultivation and undeveloped, 
they can't appreciate a man and show him marks of esteem unless he has that aureole of wealth of friends and i noticed how little by little when they saw that i was poor their behavior to me showed more and more indifference until they have come almost to despise me it is horrible but it is absolutely the truth here i have been in action i have fought they have seen me under fire he continued but when will it all end i think never and my strength and energy have already begun to flag then i had imagined la guerre la vie de camp but it isn't at all what i see in a sheepskin jacket dirty linen soldier's boots and you go out in ambuscade and the whole night long lie in the ditch with some antonov reduced to the ranks for drunkenness and any minute from behind the bush may come a rifle shot and hit you or antonov it's all the same which that is not bravery it's horrible c'est affreux it's killing well you can be promoted a non-commissioned officer for this campaign and next year an ensign i said yes it may be they promised me that in two years and it's not up yet what would those two years amount to if i knew anyone you can imagine this life with pavel dmitrievich cards low jokes drinking all the time if you wish to tell anything that is weighing on your mind you would not be understood or you would be laughed at they talk with you not for the sake of sharing a thought but to get something funny out of you yes and so it has gone in a brutal beastly way and you are always conscious that you belong to the rank and file they always make you feel that hence you can't realize what an enjoyment it is to talk a cour over to such a man as you i had never imagined what kind of a man i was and consequently i did not know what answer to make him will you have your lunch now asked nikita at this juncture approaching me unseen in the darkness and as i could perceive vexed at the presence of a guest nothing but curd dumplings there's none of the roast beef left has the captain had his lunch yet he went to bed long ago replied nikita gruffly according to my directions i was to bring you lunch here and your brandy he muttered something else discontentedly and sauntered off to his tent after loitering a while longer he brought us nevertheless a lunch case he placed a candle on the lunch case and shielded it from the wind with a sheet of paper he brought a saucepan some mustard in a jar a tin dipper with a handle and a bottle of absinthe after arranging these things nikita lingered around us for some moments and looked on as guskov and i were drinking the liqueur and it was evidently very distasteful to him by the feeble light shed by the candle through the paper amid the encircling darkness could be seen the seal cover of the lunch case the supper arranged upon it guskov's sheepskin jacket his face and his small red hands which he used in lifting the patties from the pan everything around us was black and only by straining the sight could be seen the dark battery the dark form of the sentry moving along the breastwork on all sides the watch fires and on high the ruddy stars guskov wore a melancholy almost guilty smile as though it were awkward for him to look into my face after his confession he drank still another glass of liqueur and ate ravenously emptying the saucepan yes for you it must be a relief all the same said i for the sake of saying something your acquaintance with the adjutant he is a very good man i have heard yes replied the cashiered officer he is a kind man but he can't help being what he is with his education and it is useless to expect it a flush seemed suddenly to cross his face you remarked his coarse jest this evening about the ambuscade and guskov though i tried several times to interrupt him began to justify himself before me and to show that he had not run away from the ambuscade and that he was not a coward as the adjutant and captain s tried to make him out as i was telling you he went on to say wiping his hands on his jacket such people can't show any delicacy toward a man a common soldier who hasn't much money either that's beyond their strength and here recently while i haven't received anything at all from my sister i have been conscious that they have changed toward me this sheepskin jacket which i bought of a soldier and which hasn't any warmth in it because it's all worn off and here he showed me where the wool was gone from the inside it doesn't arouse in him any sympathy or consideration for my unhappiness but scorn which he does not take pains to hide whatever my necessities may be as now when i have nothing to eat except soldiers gruel and nothing to wear he continued casting down his eyes 
and pouring out for himself still another glass of liqueur he does not even offer to lend me some money though he knows perfectly well that i would give it back to him but he waits till i am obliged to ask him for it but you appreciate how it is for me to go to him in your case i should say square and fair vous êtes adouces de cela mon cher je n'ai pas la sou and you know said he looking straight into my eyes with an expression of desperation i am going to tell you square and fair i am in a terrible situation pouvez-vous me prêter dix roubles argent my sister ought to send me some by mail et mon père why most willingly said i although on the contrary it was trying and unpleasant especially because the evening before having lost at cards i had left only about five roubles in nikita's care in a moment said i arising i will go and get it at the tent no by and by ne vous dérangez pas nevertheless not heeding him i hastened to the closed tent where stood my bed and where the captain was sleeping alexey ivanovitch let me have ten roubles please for rations said i to the captain shaking him what have you been losing again but this very evening you were not going to play any more murmured the captain still half asleep no i have not been playing but i want the money let me have it please makatuik shouted the captain to his servant hand me my bag with the money hush hush said i hearing guskov's measured steps near the tent what why hush because that cashiered fellow has asked to borrow it of me he's right there well if you knew him you wouldn't let him have it remarked the captain i've heard about him he's a dirty low-lived fellow nevertheless the captain gave me the money ordered his man to put away the bag pulled the flap of the tent neatly to and again saying if you only knew him you wouldn't let him have it drew his head down under the coverlet now you owe me thirty-two remember he shouted after me when i came out of the tent guskov was walking near the settees and his slight figure with his crooked legs his shapeless cap his long white hair kept appearing and disappearing in the darkness as he passed in and out of the light of the candles he made believe not to see me i handed him the money he said merci and crumpling the bank bill thrust it into his trousers pocket now i suppose the game is in full swing at the adjutant's he began immediately after this yes i suppose so he's a wonderful player always bold and never backs out when he's in luck it's fine but when it does not go well with him he can lose frightfully he has given proof of that during this expedition if you reckon his valuables he has lost more than fifteen hundred roubles but as he played discreetly before that officer of yours seemed to have some doubts about his honor well that's because he nikita haven't we any of the red kavkas wine left i asked very much enlivened by guskov's conversational talent nikita still kept muttering but he brought us the red wine and again looked on angrily as guskov drained his glass in guskov's behavior was noticeable his old freedom from constraint i wished that he would go as soon as possible seemed as if his only reason for not going was because he did not wish to go immediately after receiving the money i said nothing how could you who have means and were under no necessity simply de gaieté de coeur make up your mind to come and serve in the caucasus that's what i don't understand he said to me i endeavored to explain this act of renunciation which seemed so strange to him i can imagine how disagreeable the society of those officers men without any comprehension of culture must be for you you could not understand each other you see you might live ten years and not see anything and not hear about anything except cards wine and gossip about rewards and campaigns it was unpleasant for me that he wished me to put myself on a par with him in his position and with absolute honesty i assured him that i was very fond of cards and wine and gossip about campaigns and that i did not care to have any better comrades than those with whom i was associated but he would not believe me well you may say so he continued but the lack of women's society i mean of course femme comme il faut is that not a terrible deprivation i don't know what i would give now to go into a parlor if only for a moment and to have a look at a pretty woman even though it were through a crack he said nothing for a little and drank still another glass of the red wine 
oh my god my god if only it might be our fate to meet again somewhere in petersburg to live and move among men among ladies he drank up the dregs of the wine still left in the bottle and when he had finished it he said ah pardon maybe you wanted some more it was horribly careless of me however i suppose i must have taken too much and my head isn't very strong there was a time when i lived on morskaya street a rue de chasse and had marvellous apartments furniture you know and i was able to arrange it all beautifully not so very expensively though my father to be sure gave me porcelains flour and silver a wonderful lot le matin je sortais visits five years regulièrement i used to go and dine with her often she was alone il faut avouer que c'était une femme ravissante you didn't know her at all did you no you see there was such a high degree of womanliness in her and such tenderness and what love lord i did not know how to appreciate my happiness then we would return after the theatre and have a little supper together it was never dull where she was toujours gai toujours aimante yes and i had never imagined what rare happiness it was et j'ai beaucoup à me reprocher in regard to her je la fait souffrir et souvent i was outrageous ah what a marvellous time that was do i bore you no not at all then i will tell you about our evenings i used to go that stairway every flower-pot i knew the door-handle all was so lovely so familiar then the vestibule her room no it will never never come back to me again even now she writes to me if you will let me i will show you her letters but i am not what i was i am ruined i am no longer worthy of her yes i am ruined for ever je suis coisse there's no energy in me no pride nothing nor even rank yes i am ruined and no one will ever appreciate my sufferings every one is indifferent i am a lost man never any chance for me to rise because i have fallen morally into the mire i have fallen at this moment there was evident in his words a genuine deep despair he did not look at me but sat motionless why are you in such despair i asked because i am abominable this life has degraded me all that was in me all is crushed out it is not by pride that i hold out but by abjectness there is no dignité dans le malheur i am humiliated every moment i endure it all i got myself into this abasement this mire has soiled me i myself have become coarse i have forgotten what i used to know i can't speak french any more i am conscious that i am base and low i cannot tear myself away from these surroundings indeed i cannot i might have been a hero give me a regiment gold epaulets a trumpeter but to march in the ranks with some wild anton bondarenko or the like and feel that between me and him there was no difference at all that he might be killed or i might be killed all the same that thought is maddening you understand how horrible it is to think that some ragamuffin may kill me a man who has thoughts and feelings and that it would make no difference if alongside of me some antonov were killed a being not different from an animal and that it might easily happen that i and not this antonov were killed which is always une fatalité for every lofty and good man i know that they call me a coward grant that i am a coward i certainly am a coward and can't be anything else not only am i a coward but i am in my way a low and despicable man here i have just been borrowing money of you and you have the right to despise me no take back your money and he held out to me the crumpled bank bill i want you to have a good opinion of me he covered his face with his hands and burst into tears i really did not know what to say or do calm yourself i said to him you are too sensitive don't take everything so to heart don't indulge in self-analysis look at things more simply you yourself say that you have character keep up good heart and you won't have long to wait i said to him but not very consistently because i was much stirred 
both by a feeling of sympathy and a feeling of repentance because i had allowed myself mentally to sin in my judgment of a man truly and deeply unhappy yes he began if i had heard even once at the time when i was in that hell one single word of sympathy of advice of friendship one humane word such as you have just spoken perhaps i might have calmly endured all perhaps i might have struggled and been a soldier but now this is horrible when i think soberly i long for death why should i love my despicable life and my own self now that i am ruined for all that is worth while in the world and at the least danger i suddenly in spite of myself begin to pray for my miserable life and to watch over it as though it were precious and i cannot je ne puis pas control myself that is i could he continued after a minute's silence but this is too hard work for me a monstrous work when i am alone with others under special circumstances when you are going into action i am brave je fais mais éprouvé, because i am vain and proud that is my failing and in presence of others do you know let me spend the night with you with us they will play all night long it makes no difference anywhere on the ground while nikita was making the bed we got up and once more began to walk up and down in the darkness on the battery certainly guskov's head must have been very weak because two glasses of liqueur and two of wine made him dizzy as we got up and moved away from the candles i noticed that he again thrust the ten rouble bill into his pocket trying to do so without my seeing it during all the foregoing conversation he had held it in his hand he continued to reiterate how he felt that he might regain his old station if he had a man such as i were to take some interest in him we were just going into the tent to go to bed when suddenly a cannon ball whistled over us and buried itself in the ground not far from us so strange it was that peacefully sleeping camp our conversation and suddenly the hostile cannon ball which flew from god knows where the midst of our tents so strange that it was some time before i could realize what it was our sentinel andreev walking up and down the battery moved toward me ha he's crept up to us it was the fire here that he aimed at said he we must rouse the captain said i and gazed at guskov he stood cowering close to the ground and stammered trying to say that that's the the, the en enemy's f fire that that's height further he could not say a word and i did not see how and where he disappeared so instantaneously in the captain's tent a candle gleamed his cough which always troubled him when he was awake was heard and he himself soon appeared asking for a linstock to light his little pipe what does this mean old man he asked with a smile aren't they willing to give me a little sleep tonight first it's you with your cashiered friend then it's chamil what shall we do answer him or not there was nothing about this in the instructions was there nothing at all there he goes again said i two of them indeed in the darkness directly in front of us flashed two fires like two eyes and quickly over our heads flew one cannon-ball and one heavy shell it must have been meant for us coming with a loud and penetrating hum from the neighboring tents the soldiers hastened you could hear them hawking and talking and stretching themselves hist the fuse sings like a nightingale was the remark of the artilleryist send for nikita said the captain with his perpetually benevolent smile nikita don't hide yourself but listen to the mountain nightingales well your honor said nikita who was standing near the captain i have seen them these nightingales i am not afraid of them but here was that stranger who was here he was drinking up your red wine when he heard how that shot dashed by our tents and the shell rolled by he cowered down like some wild beast however we must send the commander of the artillery said the captain to me in a serious tone of authority and ask whether we shall reply to the fire or not it will probably be nothing at all but it still may have the goodness to go and ask him have a horse saddled do it as quickly as possible even if you take my polkin in five minutes they brought me a horse and i galloped off to the commander of the artillery look you return on foot whispered the punctilious captain else they won't let you through the lines it was half a vest to the artillery commanders the whole road ran between the tents as soon as i rode away from our fire it became so black that i could not see even the horse's ears but only the watch fires now seeming very near now very far off as they gleamed into my eyes 
after i had ridden some distance trusting to the intelligence of the horse whom i allowed free rein i began to distinguish the white four-cornered tents and then the black tracks of the road after a half hour having asked my way three times and twice stumbled over the tent stakes causing each time a volley of curses from the tents and twice been detained by the sentinels i reached the artillery commanders while i was on the way i heard two more cannon shot in the direction of our camp but the projectiles did not reach the place where the headquarters were the artillery commander ordered not to reply to the firing the more as the enemy did not remain in the same place and i went back leading the horse by the bridle making my way on foot between the infantry tents more than once i delayed my steps as i went by some soldier's tent where a light was shining and some merry andrew was telling a story or i listened to some educated soldier reading from some book while the whole division overflowed the tent or hung around it sometimes interrupting the reading with various remarks or i simply listened to the talk about the expedition about the fatherland or about their chiefs as i came around one of the tents of the third battalion i heard guskoff's rough voice he was speaking hilariously and rapidly young voices replied to him not those of soldiers but of gay gentlemen it was evidently the tent of some younger or sergeant major i stopped short i've known him a long time guskoff was saying when i lived in petersburg he used to come to my house often and i went to his he moved in the best society whom are you talking about asked the drunken voice about the prince said guskoff we were relatives you see but more than all we were old friends it's a mighty good thing you know gentlemen to have such an acquaintance you see he's fearfully rich to him a hundred silver roubles is a mere bagatelle here i just got a little money out of him enough to last me till my sister sends let's have some right away savilich my dear said guskoff coming to the door of the tent here's ten roubles for you go to the sutler get two bottles of kokonetsky anything else gentlemen what do you say and guskoff with unsteady gait with disheveled hair without his hat came out of the tent throwing open his jacket and thrusting his hands in the pockets of his trousers he stood at the door of the tent though he was in the light and i in darkness i trembled with fear lest he should see me and i went on trying to make no noise who goes there shouted guskoff after me in a thoroughly drunken voice apparently the cold took hold of him who the devil is going off with that horse i made no answer and silently went on my way end of section six end of stories by foreign authors russian authors